The Boy from Yesterday, Chapter 26, The Secrets Out Tom and Laurel got back home and continued to strategize about their search for the words to the ring. Marguerite and Clark were busy in and out of the house and only speculated a little bit on why Laurel and Tom spent so much time upstairs in Laurel's room with the door closed. Marguerite suspected they were doing more than studying that they said they were doing, but Marguerite was not a prude and trusted that Laurel and trusted Laurel that even if she and Tom were sexually active, they would be responsible about sexually transmitted disease and pregnancy prevention. All Marguerite had to do was think about herself at that age and her dreamy recollections of the summer of love in 1969, and she just smiled to herself and shrugged when Clark asked her what in the world they could be doing in Laurel's room for hours on end. Marguerite just put away the groceries and made Clark and herself some tea while she flipped through some various cookbooks, more for reading entertainment than any serious meal planning, though there was some of that too. Clark read the paper a lot when he wasn't at his store, where he was most of the time. Marguerite and Clark had the kind of relationship where they could sit in the kitchen at the, at the kitchen table and read in mostly silence and be perfectly happy. The serenity of the kitchen table downstairs was nothing like the fervency of the young couple's desperate search upstairs. Laurel sat at her desk at her computer while Tom paced the floor, which was small but still roomy enough to pace. A wall had been knocked down since the time, the, to the time that Tom had lived there, and somewhere in the back of his mind he was aware that he was pacing in a room that used to be two rooms, and occasionally he did feel that he was walking through walls. But the paint, the walls, the ceiling, the windows, and the doors had all changed probably several times, he speculated, since he was there. Occasionally he glanced out the window that never used to be there, seeing a portion of the street below that was blocked by a solid wall before. He noticed these things only as he helped Laurel to type terms into the magic box that she called her PC. Tom, while eager to find something that would help him find the magic words, tried to learn from Laurel just what Google was and why was it a verb. He first thought it had something to do with a gaggle of geese. Laurel tried to explain that her magic box was, in terms Tom might understand, a combination of the public library, the telegraph, the telephone and the typewriter powered with an electric bulb inside. But when you type something, how does the public library type back? Is there a telegraph operator on the other line? Laurel tried to explain all of that was automated, which drew a fairly blank look from Tom, and Tom remembered the mechanical automatons at Zeller's workshop and pictured automatons on the other end of the telephone while th that Laurel described her high-speed internet cable as. I just type something in and zip, it comes back, Laurel said, starting to be amazed to say it as Tom was to hear it. Then Tom frowned and looked down as if he had heard something. Then he snapped his finger and he realized his memory was triggered. Zip! That's it! The, the magic word said something in it that sounded like zip. Zippy, zippy, zooks, something like that. Well, what like that? Laurel asked, trying to type in zip to Google, only getting back information on United States Postal Service zip codes and a Wikipedia entry about zip compressed com computer files. Laurel shook her head and Tom shook his, unable to remember any more. A trip to the library again found Laurel and Tom searching some books on ancient Egyptian culture and pagan Wiccan histories. The results led to nothing that sparked Tom's memory as much as the word zip had done earlier. They finally took a walk home, passing the cemetery, but avoiding going in despite how much the last visit confused them. During the library visit and the walk home, nothing odd seemed to happen, except for a moment when Laurel kicked a big rock out from her way on the sidewalk and into the grass. Tom saw the rock fly, but didn't see Laurel's foot kick it, and even though her skirt flew up from her legs movement. Tom worried that the strange air that always smelled like chimney smoke even in springtime, the odd ways of preparing food, which was good at Marguerite's house but always tasted sweet to him, and the beverages that Laurel and Marguerite offered him with strange names like Snapple were all starting to stress his body, not to mention odd dreams of his own time and frequent waking. The music of the modern time seemed to stick in his head too, even though he still whistled tunes from his time often just out of habit. 
With every car that passed them on the street on their walk home, Tom just thought of Chestnut and felt how fast he was, but never as fast as those horseless carriages, which Laurel explained would be the word Tom would eventually learn to call them if he ever got home. As they walked, Tom gently took hold of Laurel's hand, and what they had been feeling for a while now inside seemed to be confirmed on the outside by their holding hands, even though neither said a word. As they got in the barn, though, Laurel took her hand away and ran it through her hair. It felt stuffy inside, so they left the large sliding door open to the evening air. Look, Tom, I need to tell you something, she said, indicating for them to sit down. It was getting dark by now, and Laurel walked over to the wall to flip a switch that turned one lamp on near the couch, which revealed that a moth had followed them inside from the open air. Tom still couldn't get used to how bright it was indoors, with electric lights always at the ready. The bulbs were brighter than any he had seen of electric lights in his own time, and there were always more of them. He squinted a bit as Laurel walked back over, but Laurel wouldn't sit down until Laurel had, which took getting used to for Laurel, who noticed whenever Tom was demonstrating Victorian manners that were second nature to him, but still seemed odd to her. Laurel uncharacteristically fumbled for words as she tried to preface, and then come out and say that she had essentially broken up with Christian, and that part of the reason, though not all of it, were her feelings for Tom. Tom looked deeply into Laurel's eyes and gently brushed her cheek with the back of his fingers, tracing her cheekbone and lightly brushing her hair from the temple. Both hesitated for a moment, silently looking at each other, when Laurel leaned in to kiss Tom and he kissed her back. They both lost themselves a moment in the kiss until the sound of a ticking clock on the wall reached Tom's ears, reminding him that time was passing. He pulled away and stood up in one motion with a cry of frustration. I can't! I, I can't! Tom said, wiping the hair from his brow, sighing and brushing what Laurel thought was a tear from his eye. He began pacing again. Ma'am, Tom said, which is what he called Laurel when he didn't know what to say. What do we do? My best friend is sick right there over yonder, and I'm here acting like Romeo. Laurel realized that the Romeo and Juliet story was before both of their times, which was one of the few things they could say that about, unless they got into the Bible, or the rest of Shakespeare, or Chaucer, or Wuthering Heights, or other topics they just didn't have time for now. Tom, it's okay, really. I know we'll find it. We'll, we'll find those magic words, Laurel said. How? Tom cried, half yelling and half in exasperation. How? I get here, I time travel on the hopes of saving my friend, like like a brother to me, or more, and I haven't gotten a notion of how to get back? What kind of fearsome dream is that? Laurel stood up and gently held his shoulders. Tom, we'll find them. I have some more ideas of where to look. It just takes time. There are other databases, maybe old books on microfilm at the library, maybe even old documentaries on YouTube. I can check. I don't know what you're saying. What's a mitre deal? All this pish posh. It's like everyone around here has taken the English language and just made a gibberish out of it for every dadgum thing around. I can't tell what some newfangled invention that y'all have around here for every little thing. Tom, try to calm down. I know it's overwhelming. I would feel that way too if I were from your time. I just can't imagine. I can't believe any of it myself. But I know it's real. I know the magic is real. And that's very different from any of the science that we have now that explains all these inventions. I can explain a, a little anyway about Google or my iPhone or texting or DVDs or all of that. It, it's science, that's all. But we're, we're dealing with is real magic here. And that's as strange to me as all these scientific inventions are to you. But isn't all this, this, Tom said as he gestured toward the electric oven, the microwave, and the coffee maker on the mini kitchen's countertop, isn't that magic too? Laurel shook her head. It's not the same, Tom. Not like this. What happened to you is different. You didn't fly here in an airplane. You didn't come here in a spaceship. One minute you were there and the next you were here. That's not science, Tom, not even for our time. Even in the year 2020, we don't have magic rings that do that, not for anyone. 
And I wouldn't have believed it if you didn't show me yourself right here, she employed as she walked toward the rougher end of the room where the shoe, horseshoe had been. I wouldn't have believed it if you hadn't proven it to me. And now that you're here, you, we, need to find whatever it is that made that happen and make it, I don't know, unhappen, however these things work. How? How? We've been to the library. We've used Doodle. Google. All right, then Google. Have it your way. Ye gods, what a dumb name to call a contraption, by the way. Who invented that? Lewis Carroll? It's like Alice's adventures through the looking glass, if you ask me. It's all Wonderland. Meanwhile, my friend Sam is dying upstairs over yonder in a house that stood over 130 years ago. And you ask me to calm down, woman? It's madness. Okay, that's it, a voice from outside the big sliding door of the barn called. It was Emily, eyebrow cocked, entering the room from the dark outside, closely followed by TJ, also eyebrow cocked, arms crossed in his best don't mess with me way. Laurel and Tom whipped around in the direction of the voice. That's it, Canadian buddy boy. What's going on here and why are you taking that tone with my girl here? Emily said, planting her feet and staring at Tom from inside the doorway. Em, how long have you been there? Laurel said. Uh, long enough, homegirl, DJ said. Long enough to not like what we're hearing, that's for sure. Now, son, he said, walking over to Tom, unafraid and confront of his protective instincts toward Laurel kicking in. You want to explain the gig here? You up to some kind of amazing David Blaine action here? Identity theft? Just what is the gig, my strangely fragrant cracker brother? Hmm, identity theft. Is that it? A con? Did you hear about Lars's trust fund and decide you wanted to get your Canadian paws on some of that American greenback, sir? Emily said, a fire in her eyes that Laurel had only seen a few times before, like when she killed the wasp in the room a while back, protecting Laurel from a possible sting. Guys, Laurel said, it's not like that. Calm down. You say that a lot, ma'am, Tom said, trying to make light of the situation. Guys, sit down. It's all true. Laurel said, again gesturing toward the couch, where Emily and TJ sat down, but still keeping their eyes on Tom. Laurel explained as much as she could, and Tom filled in the story up to now of how they met. At the barn, about the horseshoe, how they got him new clothes and a new haircut as a disguise right away. About the story about being a Canadian exchange student to have him close by in the barn apartment, learning to pass as a modern guy, and about how it all began with the mysterious magician and the magic ring. T.J. kept the skeptical look on his face, and Laurel sat silently. But she knew Laurel long enough to know when she was telling the truth and when she was lying, and none of the lying signs, Laurel's eyes dilating, for example, or the slight blush to her cheeks when she lied, were there. This in part reassured Emily, but on the other hand disturbed her, for believing Laurel and Tom's story meant believing in something else, magic, that she had never seen proven before. T.J. kept looking at Tom, in part to judge what he was saying, and, and in part trying to figure out all the odd expressions Tom spoke with, which would have been awfully hard for someone to fake for that long. There was a long pause of silence. Finally, Emmy broke, Emily broke it with a big sigh. So, that wasn't how I pictured this evening going. The others finally laughed in relief. I just have one question. How are you going to keep this under wraps? If anyone else finds out about this, it's only a matter of time before we finally put old sleepy Chesterfield on the map in a way that none of us wants, especially if it distracts from you finding the magic words for the ring that will take you back to 1890, she said, pausing a moment before looking down and shaking her head with, God, I can't believe I just said that. What else does this ring do, TJ said, admiring it on Tom's finger as if it were a new piece of expensive jewelry Tom was showing off instead of a, a mysterious talisman capable of great unexplained power. We don't know exactly, said Tom. I just know that it made me time travel after Zeller gave it to me. I don't really know all it's capable of. I never learned. I guess it was just part of, the mystery of my mystery to find out. Actually, it's mine to find out, dude. Another voice cracked the air from the direction of the open sliding door. Loud, deep part angry and part sobbing. It was Christian, almost stumbling into the doorway, breathing heavily. Christian, what are you doing here? 
Laurel said, rushing over to the doorway, Tom beside her, followed by TJ and Emily. What am I doing here? What am I doing here? You're harboring some kind of illegal immigrant from another century, and you're asking what I'm doing here? Christian said, part slurring, but looking at Laurel with deep red glistening eyes and a deep scowl. Uh-oh, he's in a mood again. Okay, Mr. T, it's time for you to scurry on home now, TJ said, gently putting his arm around Christian and trying to turn him back around to the doorway. Christian sloughed off TJ's arm and stepped away. And stepped away. Get away from me, brown sugar, Christian almost growled. I hate it when he calls me that, TJ said, shaking his head, rolling his eyes, and backing away. Christian straightened up and walked toward Laurel. So, is this it? Is this him? Is this the guy you dumped me for? Some kind of time-traveling freak show? Sir, Tom finally spoke up, you are not welcome here, especially in your current state of drink. The lady is not willing to speak with you. And why don't you let the lady speak for her own damn self, Mr. Lincoln? Christian snarled at Tom. I, I will, and I'll say it in a way that you'll understand. Get out, Laurel said, half crying through that. The room was quiet. Christian was tall, big, and unstable when he was like this. All right, all right, I will. I'll let you too, Christian said, waving his finger back and forth at Tom and Laurel. Love birds, have your little cozy nest back. But I think it's only fair that instead I get the wedding gift, huh? How about a little trade, old boy? He looked at Tom and walked up to him close to his face. Tom stood his ground, eyes cold and stealing. I'll trade you something worthless, Christian said, glancing over at Laurel, then looking back at Tom while Emily's nose flared, standing still and behind, but taking it in all in carefully. For something nice, a genuine antique, he said, suddenly shoving Tom to the ground, but Tom got back up and pushed him back as the others backed up. Christian came back and punched Tom in the face, and Tom punched Christian back in the stomach. Christian lunged and tackled Tom to the ground. Guys, guys, knock that shit off, Laurel. Stop, Laurel said. You wake up, Clark, and you'll all get shot. You get it? Christian and Tom struggled on the floor for a moment, Christian grabbing at Tom's left hand. Then suddenly Christian pulled away, stood up, and ran toward the door. Wait! Tom yelled. Christian turned back with a maniacal grin held up his left hand and pointed at it with his right. His left ring finger had Tom's ring on it. And why, Tom? Why wait? Wait for my ship to come in? Wait for my fortune? Oh, no. I don't think so, history man freak, Christian yelled and then calmed a moment into a cool sarcasm. If you weren't history before, Christian sneered, you will be soon. I'm out of here. If I can control time with this, I get everything I wanted. And if you call the cops or snitch, I'll go to the police and the press and make them cart you away to the loony bin or some science lab like the freak of nature that you are. I get something, he said as he looked at the ring on his finger, the eyes of the dragon dull and unlit. And you get something, he said, pointing at Laurel and turning toward the door. Then he turned back, looking at Laurel. Uh, no offense there, sweetheart, but when I compare to you, to what I'm going to get with this... I think poor old Tom here got the short end of the stick. Kiss, kiss, and congratulations, and don't follow me. And with that, he disappeared into the night. Tom ran towards the door and outside after him, but Christian had sped off in his car, weaving down the road as his taillights faded in the distance. Tom came back inside. TJ and Emily stood silently. Tom wrapped his arm around Laurel, who was sobbing. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm so sorry, Laurel said. Tom hugged her closer, his eyes also reddening and tearing up, not only because Laurel was crying and he hated to see her upset, but also sad for himself, that he was starting to lose hope that he would ever get back to Sam, and wondering how that might affect the course of time and history. He tried to awkwardly choke back his own tears, causing that pain in your head that you get when you try to suppress crying when you really need to. He can't do anything without the words, either. We still have to look for them, and then get it back somehow, without anyone else finding out what it is. Once we have the words, and once we get the ring back... Tom's voice trailed off, realizing how hard that would be. TJ and Emily looked at each other, and 
reached out their hands to one another. Emily stood up straighter as she turned back to Laurel and Tom. This is not over, Elle, Emily said. Not this way. Not yet.